let's pivot to real estate investing because that's what you're doing now and you're encouraging others to do it. And what's your mm -hmm. philosophy behind it? And why are you doing it? My philosophy is uh, but, but why not? Basically, <laughs> you know that we can, but we are all quite intimidated by it. And so we don't rather than we have a lot of reasons. Why not? Why not to, but why not? And so for me, um, just on a personal purpose level, I have always wanted to help people figure out how to be liberated from whatever it is that they feel was holding them back, right? And I, I just wow. found that that's just kind of what I do, you know? And so, um, you know, if it's your thought process, right? Like when we work in the production business, you know how it is production, we create miracles all the time. <laughs> you don't know how you're gonna make that happen. And that just so happened. true. See all this you did silver it. hair? That's yeah, right. what production did. That's right. <laughs> See the exactly. loss of my hair these days. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's something truly amazing about that business because it's so true that you just have to produce the results, right? Yeah. And um, I think I was already that nature and production refined that in me. And then um, then when I took that onto the college and helped other people that wanted to be production people, it's an even further that feeling of helping people understand they can go do and be whatever it is they thought they wanted to go do and be. Um, and that whatever was between that is really in their head more than anything. Like everything else is just logistics. You can manage it. That's how I feel about real estate investing. And I think that most of us and especially women have not really been taught um, and marginalized communities have not been taught and we haven't really been presented as a real true viable option. Like it's not that hard. If you can go buy a car, you could probably go buy a house. You know what I mean? Like, but we don't think like that. And we think uh -huh. of it as being such a giant thing. Like a car seems manageable, but a house seems so huge. So mm -hmm. um, part of it is helping people demystifying that. And then also uh, on a personal level, well, we, we owned our own family business as I grew up with cabinetry and custom furniture. And so I always had sort of this compulsion anyway to just be my own boss. Boss. I think if you asked any of my bosses, they would tell you that that's true. <laughs> I, 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 I you, kind of, you know, always had I that entrepreneurial, you. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm an entrepreneurial spirit. Just let me yeah. go. It'll be fine. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And then my parents also, I think there's that piece about learning that anything is possible just by watching my parents run their own business and then build things and design things and create things. Uh, be, before and then they invested property but before that going all the way back four generations ago the ladies in my family on my mom's side the spinster aunts and the bachelor uncle uh is how we know of them uh, they invested in real estate together they the 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 sisters and the brother all lived together well into their old age. They, none of them ever married. They had some suitors, but it didn't work out. And uh, they invested. And so they had real, real estate in uh, Spokane, Washington, rental properties. And so my grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, apparently skipped from that her mom, their sister, did not invest in real estate, but my grandmother did. So the great aunts taught my grandmother about real estate investing. And then later when my grandmother and grandfather got married, she invested in real estate and then they invested in real estate. And so then when my parents, I watched my parents go off and invest in real estate. So in the back of my mind always was, well, that's a viable option. That seems like they did it. Why couldn't I do it? Which is another thing I don't think we always see is modeling, right? Mm -hmm. But they did it. Sure. It can't be that. I mean, I can see that it's work. I watch them go sweat and paint and stress about things, you know, but mm -hmm. so um, then I became, I call it sometimes an accidental landlord because I bought a new house in 2008. I did exactly what a lot of people do, which is uh, I, it was however age I was, it was in my thirties and it was time to get a house, right? And then it was time to have a baby. And then it was time to uh, later flash forward, have another one. And then that meant a bigger house in a better school district. So flash forward into 2008, we bought a new house in that recession as it just began. We didn't know what was about to happen, but I bought this house that I'm sitting in now, this beautiful home that I love. And, um, a great value and the market just kept going down and we decided not to sell the house we had just moved from because it didn't seem like a great time to sell it was a great time to buy because the market was going down it wasn't a great time to sell so we rented the house well first i refinanced the house and cashed out so i took a chunk of cash and i used that as the down payment on the new house and um rented the old house and I, that's how I became kind of an accidental landlady and i knew i had always wanted to do that but it was almost not like a conscious plan it was almost yeah. like an accident, 
It was yeah. like, well, the timing isn't good, so we'll just rent it out, you know? Right. But then I realized, as so many times, I think it was like a little North Star for a long time. It just, the clouds would cover it, and I wouldn't remember that I had that ambition that I had been modeled for me my whole life. And so, um, at any rate, that's how I became the accidental landlady. And I reflected a lot in these last few years of becoming a realtor about my family upbringing and where it all really came from. And why am I so impassioned? And why isn't it enough for me to just do the HGTV version and buy and sell houses? It isn't. It isn't satisfying. That's what I learned last year. Like, that's not, it doesn't feel authentic. I don't want to just talk about the paint and the carpet. <laughs> like, I want to talk about how this can change your life. You know, right. I want to talk about how you can, you make a plan that's like a seven, 10, 15 year plan. I want to talk about how you can have enough money at the age of 50, which I really wish somebody would have said this to me because now I'm 55 and this would have been useful when I left right. my other job. Right. I want people to understand that if they could get to the age of 50 and have enough of a nest egg that they had already created for themselves, that they could divest themselves of having to exchange one hour of their lifetime for compensation defined by another human being, that that would be true freedom, mm -hmm. true freedom. Mm -hmm. That's my goal, right? So um, my point is, I think that is also informed by the other side of my family and the contrast that I saw growing up. Mm -hmm. So my Western family, my mom's side of the family is from the West. They invested and I saw that now that nobody was rolling it's like not like the Warbucks family you know it's not like it's not like that it was just <laughs> I I learned they invested but I wouldn't have known that looking from the outside and everything looked like a normal middle class Americana stuff right over here on my southern side which is my dad's side of the family my dad was literally born into a house with a dirt floor they were very 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 poor that's I didn't, the name hence the name dirt per Dirt poor. Dirt right? poor, right? Yeah. Exactly. Poor. So yeah. I didn't really, you know, you get older when you learn all these stories. When I was right. little, I didn't know that. No. I didn't, my granny and my grandpa and my great, they all lived like three generations, that my granny, grandpa, and great grandmother all lived together in what seemed like a huge place to me. But I went back later, of course, it's this big. How is it that? But, Everything looks right? bigger when we're small. It was yeah. so, but yeah. the, um, they never owned their own home and mm. my granny and grandpa and they were wonderful wonderful people of course there was nothing missing when i reflect upon it now there was nothing missing there was wealth and abundance on every level there was love and food and laughter and all of those things but when this granny the southern granny got older and when the western granny got older this, this western granny had her home to live in and uh she had options about where she lived and the southern granny had to live with her children because she didn't own her home and she didn't have the same options it was fine everybody's yeah. happy to have her live right it was just so different the contrast so then i could see what the difference was nothing everything else was the same except one had the security that the other one did not and well, it's and, always um, nice so to have options me. you know mm -hmm. i think yes it, and it seems like that's what you're really focusing on julie is just it's not about just finding you a house but it's kind of giving you a plan for your future, helping people with that. It's, it's, a, yes. it's a lot larger scope than just, okay, there's your house. See you. Check it off my yes. list and off I go. Right. 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 That's exactly that's, right. I get really invested with them. I work really mm -hmm. hard with people and I get, I think that's been another interesting, that's why I said I had to take it, not, not take it personally and not want it more than they do. Cause sometimes yeah. somebody just wants a house, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. they don't want to think about it. Like I think about it, you know, they just want to think about <laughs> yeah. it, but I just want this condo. I like it. Yeah. Okay. You know, what does one need to um, have in place to become a real estate investor? Yeah. Um, That's a good question. Well, actually. Mm -hmm. I think first off, you need, uh, if you're going to invest in something, you need 20 to 25% down payment. So right off the bat, you do actually have to have a little bit of money for this one. Okay. So to be a first time home buyer, you don't have to have too much. You can probably get away investing. with ten dollars to $15,000. Investing, you have to have 20 to 25% coming in, which is why perhaps refinancing and getting cash out in a, of your equity position might make sense for someone. Okay. So let me understand that you have a home, you've owned it, you've owned it for I don't know, 20 years, almost paid off. You could then take the equity out of that home and reinvest it in something else. That's what you're That's saying. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So here's a yeah. question then, just to follow up what she's saying. So let's say you're going to invest in a home, but you can't cash out. You can't make a cash deal on the home. How does that work? So you pulled the equity cash out. You have yeah. the 25%, mm -hmm. but right. the home is 
whatever, <coughs> 400 grand or, you know, oh. whatever it is. Okay. Right. So you need to qualify for a, a loan. Yes. How do. does, how do you judge Line that? of credit and equity yes. line of credit, right? Well, no, nope, you just go get equity, a mortgage. Yeah, you, you get, get a mortgage. mortgage. Yeah. However, you can use up to 75% of the rental income on the property okay. you're purchasing as okay. income towards purchasing the property, right? Okay. So before you even have a tenant in it, mm -hmm. you can use up to 75% of that. So for instance, uh, and actually, yes. For instance, if you think your rent's going to be six, if an appraiser, the appraiser decides, we don't decide. So mm -hmm. the appraiser decides that the rental estimate on that house that you want to buy for $400,000 is, is uh, $2,000 a month. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 75% of that is 1500 bucks, right? Okay. So you can use the, the lender will calculate whatever your income is and your assets, whatever you've told them is your income and add that 75%, that $1,500 a month times 12 as mm -hmm. your income to pay for that house. So the truth is you only have to factor in your mind, 25% of your income has to be able to pay for the new property. Got it. Okay. Got it. If that helps. That's really and I, helpful information. Yeah. 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 Mortgagecalculator.org mm. is my favorite mortgage calculator. It's a simple thing. I play this game all the time because you can find out within a few dollars for real of what your mortgage payment would actually be. Um, right I mean, every lender is different, but really is mortgagecalculator.org. It's real straightforward. You always make sure you put in everything you can find. So the taxes, if there happen to be any HOAs, homeowners association dues, mm. um, mm. You've got your insurance, you've got your taxes and your homeowners uh, dues and that's it. And then th there's usually a default um, percentage in there of 3.8%. Right now, uh, rates are significantly under that, like up to a point under that, like 2.7. So you're, you could mess with that percentage to be able to better understand how a percentage point changes your, how much a percentage point changes. So the lower... Everybody, if can everybody, if everybody can understand that the lower the interest rate goes, the more their buying power increases. Mm -hmm. So it's not literally more money out of our pockets to pay more for the loan itself. Buy. It's actually you're paying for the house. Yeah, and I like to call it. I that's a that's a whole power of leverage thing, and a lot of people don't think about that. So as an investor, and back to your whole piece about the question. So you're using other people's money, OPM. Let's figure out how to how to use <laughs> other people's money with. Um, uh, uh, to, to leverage other people's money to buy you an investment property that you then rent out to another person that pays the whole mortgage payment for the investment property, but you've only put down 25%, mm -hmm. right. right? So people don't usually think about it like that, but that's how we right. have to think about it. We're leveraging, it's right. the power of other people's money, the bank's money, it's the bank's money, yeah. right? So the bank right. is saying, this thing is going to cost you $400,000, but we're only going to make you put down, what is 20, 80, 100 grand, you know, so 25%. So we'll have you put down 25%, but we're going to give you, you get to live and possess and paint and do and whatever you want with $300,000 worth of money that isn't yours. Right. If you look at it, like that's what a house is. And somebody that's else why is I get so excited. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. then in the case of investment property, literally somebody else's paint is the greatest thing ever. In the beginning, when I became an accidental landlady in the beginning, um, I had to subsidize my rent. So we were going downward right on that trajectory. It was 2008 and I had just borrowed cash. So my, uh, my mortgage payment went up, right? So when you cash out, you have to pay each month for that. Mm -hmm. But I looked so that when I first had a renter, I had to pay $400 extra per month. The rent did not meet the mortgage. Okay. So in the very beginning, the first year, it was a challenge because I had my new house right. and my bigger house payment. Right. And then I had my old house and the refi, and now I had to pay an extra 400 bucks. So it was a stretch for one year, uh -huh. but I kept, I looked at it like that $400. First of all, somebody was Fantastic. paying me most of it to live mm -hmm. in that house. Right. <laughs> and then the 400, I looked at it as my, my cost of borrowing the money to pay for the new house. So by the time I got to the second year, I had to, that tenant moved out and I had to subsidize at $200. By the time I got to the third year, I was at zero. I didn't have to subsidize it and I have made money on it ever since. And I just sold it for three times what I paid for it. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm reinvesting that money not right to now. Mention the equity. Yeah. Not to mention the equity yeah. that you gained from it and also the that's value. Correct. Yeah. So that's you had exactly all that. it. Plus mm -hmm. you could write that off. Plus all, all that is. Oh, plus any repair. A tax write off. All of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and I mean, another, we're back to that other thing about, I think as, as, as women and as people in particular, we are 
oh, it's one of the things that drives me nuts about school, right? They don't really teach us finance math. If they yeah. would teach us finance math, we would all understand this a little bit better as we come right out of the gate. We would understand right away about investing in compounded interest and owning property and uh, all the markets have gone up and down and up and down for years, but they only ever go up. So, you know, at the end of the day, we all, if you just sit back and look at a graph, you know, it used to cost this in the forties and it costs this now, Yeah. you know, and in between it went down and up and down and up, but it's like this, but, yeah. but it's so scary and big to everybody. And all they mostly think about is, well, what if it goes down? It's like, right. well, it will go down at some point for sure. Cause that's historically, but your goal is to hang on when it goes down. You don't sell then you hang on and you rent it out. Even if you have to subsidize a little, you still get to own the property plus the equity plus the taxes and so on. Right. So that's, that's the stuff I'm trying to teach people, but it gets a little, you know, it's a lot to have in a conversation when you're having a cocktail. Right. <laughs> oh gosh, Julie, <laughs> we could go on and on. I think we should actually wrap this up, but we have one major question. What's the health of the market right now? And what is the oh. forecast? Yes, the market is, um, like I said, for as far as a seller's market, it is so hot right now that there isn't really anything to say about it. There's no, there's no inventory. And how so if far there's out anything, into the future do you see that con, uh, continuing? That is a very interesting question. Historically, August is the slowest month of our year because everyone turns their attention, you know, from summer to going back to school and all the work and stuff. However, COVID year, we don't know. We don't know what August might look like. However, um, historically, August is slow and then November, December, January slow. So in the world of buying opportunities, if you're a buyer, I say pay close attention in August and then uh, November, December, January, because you can often find Again, we might have an inventory shortage, but you won't have as much buyer demand because buyers are doing other things. They have other uh -huh. priorities. Yeah. So if you have the ability to focus on a house search during the months that other people are focusing on other things, um, that is very, very helpful. Uh, next year, we're not really sure exactly how everything's going to shake out, but there are some folks who are predicting that we might have some foreclosures next year. So as we go through the rest of this year, how we have to see how quickly we, we recover. We have to see if we're gonna get some more of the assistance from the federal government so that people can continue to stay in their homes. If people cannot continue to stay in their homes, then we may see a flood of homes come onto the market. And that I think right now there are so many buyers that I don't know that it's gonna have a quick, a quick equalizing It'll take a while right. before we have enough inventory to meet the buyer demand to make it equalize. We have under a month of inventory right now. It's crazy. Six mm -hmm. months is a balanced inventory, balanced market. Six months of each is considered balanced. We are way out of whack right now with so way wow. many more buyers. So about a year and a half, we think that we're going to see uh, from the rest of this year through next year, a lot of pent up buyer demand, maybe some foreclosures next year, uh, maybe yeah. some pre foreclosures which is where people have the opportunity to re -get, regain their house and they will probably regain their houses, but then that they might have to put them back on the market or put them on the market. Uh -huh. So we'll look at that, but next year maybe have a little bit more, um, might have a little more inventory. And if you were happen to be an investor, uh, it might be a good time to think about whether or not there's some bargain for you out there. Hmm. Dear, it sounds like, as you just mentioned, that usually the balance is six months inventory, six months buyers. Sorry. Six months of inventory. That's exactly right. But right okay. now, if inventory, when inventory goes fast, right? So we haven't had six months in ages, to be so honest. So you have you, one years. month of so inventory. So we have like a month and a half or something right now. So that means if all the buyers bought all the houses, they'd all be gone in like six weeks, five weeks. Okay. So, so in a perfect market, you got six months. Everybody's moving at a better pace. Right. Uh, prices aren't running through the, the roof. But right Can now we're in a heated market. Do you think some people are hanging on to their home out of maybe nervousness because of what's been happening? Also, they don't have other places to go. Yeah. That is a good question. Okay. So we've seen some people who have chosen to move like COVID for sure, reflect upon it and realize we don't need all this. Mm -hmm. We want to sell our house and where to go is the challenge because um, markets everywhere are hot. So, yeah. you know, you can't, I don't, it doesn't matter. I think you said it earlier, Sharon, everywhere across the nation is crazy hot. Buyers want to buy. Yeah. And so, um, yes, people are going to pay a premium if they move right now. And I definitely have had people who won't list their house right now for that reason, because they're nervous 
especially if this is really their only asset and I've got some sing, single women clients in there, uh, you know, I am me too. I'm my only, I'm the, the primary breadwinner of mm -hmm. my family and my household. So uh, when you are that, uh, you know that you are without when you sell your house, like you are floating and then there is something. I have a friend who's doing that now and it's a wonderful life. She's having a great time. But at the end of that, you know, she's got to go buy a house. So she was asking me recently, like, what do you think it's going to be like when I have to buy a house? So we'll see. We'll, we'll find out. But I just thought of a quick investment strategy. So one strategy to address what you just said is you can, um, you could sell a house now, move into a house, like buy a house. Let's say it wasn't your favorite house. You're going to sell your house now, tap in the money, uh, go buy another house, but you know it's not your ideal. Buy the other house, live in it for two years, mm -hmm. um, rent that house for three more years. At the end of that five-year period, you can sell that house and not owe capital gains tax on it. And that's a whole nother discussion, but capital okay. gains is quite yes. significant. Right, yeah. right, so, right. Yeah. Wait, right? Wait. So yeah. it's an interesting way. I know a mortgage broker that this is her strategy. She, this is what she does every two years. So she sold, she reached a certain point in her fifties and said, uh, she was single now and said, uh, this is what I'm going to do. Sold her house, went and bought a house, spiffed it up, made it mm -hmm. look good, took two years, painted and landscaped and futzed, mm -hmm. sold, uh, rented the house for three years, went and bought another house. So during that three year period, she was doing a two year fl fluff a house period. Okay. Fluff the rented house. that house. Yeah. Right. Then buy another house. So she's in a cycle of two over. years until yeah. she, she said recently, till I'm tired of doing that. And then, but at each time she doesn't have to pay the capital gains. And that's what I'm learning in my own sale. It's quite significant. Uh, so you, it's, it's useful if you can reinvest your funds, if you're an investor, mm -hmm. so that you don't, you don't have to take a, the capital gains tax on your investment money. But even better, if you can find a tax strategy, which is also very important in what we're discussing is tax strategies. And something that I think we get up against is that we get nervous about taxes and we think we don't know anything about them, but tax strategies. So what's the right strategy? If I'm going to be an investor, do I want to own multiple investment properties or do I just want to own one at a time? And if I just want to own one at a time, do I want to do that fluff them thing and roll in them? Do I just enjoy painting and fluffing houses? Or um, So there are a lot of different strategies that you can use to invest in real estate and make it fun and fit your lifestyle. These are my favorite conversations. I get all excited and amped oh, up when I talk yeah. about this stuff. So yeah, I could talk about it forever with I, anyone. I wish so. we could go on because I really do think there's so, just a lot more, but you've given us a lot to think about. I think you've also addressed the idea that why is it so important, especially for women, yeah. to think about whether they should own or rent. And manageable yeah. options. Yeah. But, you know, there, there yeah. are so many ways to look at how to invest or to get into a home. Whatever you decide your goals are, you've, you've helped make it manageable. My one last closing thought that I would say, uh, I think this is whole thing. We talked once at the prep meeting, we were talking about how it can be so emotional to buy a house, right? You know, right. and it's true. And I think, um, as I really reflect upon it, because it's money, right? And we have a lot of feelings about money, a lot of emotion about money. And we have a lot of, sometimes we have a lot of distrust of ourselves about money. We've, we've learned certain lessons. We've had certain messages. We've lost money and then beat ourselves up about it or I lost $200 out of, a, out of my pocket on a trail in Arizona. <laughs> and I am sure I knew the girl who took my $200 and I had to relax my brain because we were standing there talking and say, that sweet young little girl was having a terrible day and needed the money. And mm -hmm. so it fell out of my pocket because it was supposed to, you know what I mean? So, but I yeah. had to come to that place and not right. beat myself up when I lost money. Right. So on, going on a bigger Mm -hmm. There's a lot of values. There's a lot of belief systems. There's a lot of shame. Sometimes there's a lot mm -hmm. of, um, uh, like, uh, constraints. People feel, feel a lot of constraints about money. So for me, I had to, um, I've had to explore that a lot in my lifetime. Like, what do I think about money? What do I think about the acquisition of money? What do I think? Do I think it's bad? Do I think I'm not supposed to have it? I'm supposed to, you know, I'm more, altruistic if I don't have it or if I'm giving it all away, for instance. Um, no. No. So I, right? Not well, there. I, it's the oxygen Never. mask thing. Good, no. good. No, you, don't, you deserve it just as much as the, the other guy deserves it. 
Amen. But I can see I am people get defensive that. about money too, because just like you said, oh, I should have done, that, you know, so then yeah. there's this defense mechanism that happens instead of right. just being able to be transparent about, okay, well, maybe that happened, but now here's what we're going to do. And here's the options you have. Exactly. That's where I'm going. Money. Yeah. This was the best advice I've ever been given recently. It is energy. Money oh, is energy. Great. Energy does not get stuck. Energy That's goes great. and it ebbs and flows. So sometimes if there's a lack of, but that means you're filling your pot because there there, it's gathering for more room, making space for more room to come in. That's how we should look at money. If you hold, if you hold it back, you choke it. And if you fear lack of it, it won't come, it won't come forward. And you've yeah, given absolutely. us a lot of information on how we can use what we have to gain more of it. <laughs> That's right. You know what? Uh, I'm going to give you one little thing. If once you experience, once we experience, we have enough, all the energy we used trying to get more of what we don't need is freed up to make a difference with what we have. Oh, Chew on that for a while. That'll be great. I will put I've that been talking down. to myself for four years. That mantra has been mine since okay. I quit having a steady income. <laughs> Say it one more time. Say it one more once, time. Once we experience, we have enough. All the energy we used trying to get more of what we don't need is freed up to make a difference with what we have. And thank you. Investing in real estate is investing in yourself. Yes. So that's all true, right? That's all yeah. true. So yeah, I think uh, those those are like the things that drive me as a realtor right there. And if if we and finding people like you who believe in the abundance and, and us lifting each other up. That's what we're all going for. It's yeah, we are. That's thank what you for this time. To do here. Oh gosh. Are you kidding? Thank you. This has been beautiful. Yeah. I really appreciate <laughs> y'all so much. For us and oh cheers. my gosh. I still have oh, a yes. little wine left. Oh, I got a tiny bit. Hang on. Oh, my, me too. <laughs> mine's gone. Oh, Julie. Thank you, doll. <laughs> yeah, Jules. Mwah. Yeah. Bye, y'all. Mm. Bye, bye. Love you much. This has been we great. We love you too. Yeah, <laughs> love you we'll too. be in touch.